Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, and a very warm welcome to you wherever you may be in the world. A warm welcome to the 28th Munich Lectures in Economics and the annual Center for Economic Studies Distinguished Success Fellow Award. My name is Marcus John Henry Brown, and I will be guiding you through the next 90 minutes of laudation, lecture, and Q&A debate where you, the audience, will be able to ask questions using the Slido link that you should now be able to see on your screen. But more about the Q&As a little later. This event is important. The list of names who have been honored with the title of the Distinguished Cess Fellow really is the A-list of economist excellence. Jean Tirol, Paul Krugman, Peter Diamond, Oliver Hart, Bengt Holmstrom, and Esther Duflo, no less than six Distinguished Cess Fellows have gone on to win the Nobel Prize in their respective fields. Now, normally, Everybody would come here to Munich, but as you can see, we're still not streaming from the IFO Institute. This isn't the Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich, and this isn't a physical event with a live audience. Twelve months ago, when Professor Nick Bloom accepted this award and gave his Munich lecture, we assumed that that would be a one-off event. It wasn't. This evening's event is being streamed from Paris, from Stanford, and three separate locations spread across Munich. COVID-19 still challenges us, but slowly and surely we're becoming masters of this new context. And the CES, IFO, and LMU have curated a wonderful event for you today, and it is with great pride that I now hand over to Professor Dr. Dr. Clemens Fust, the president of the IFO Institute and the director for the Center of Economic Studies for his welcoming address. Good evening, everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you all to the 2021 Munich Lectures in Economics. Our distinguished CES fellow and Munich lecturer this year is Professor Matthew Genskau. Matthew is the Landau Professor of Technology and the Economy at the University of Stanford. We are absolutely delighted, Matthew, that you accepted the prize and, of course, that you are delivering this lecture. A very warm welcome also to Professor Ekaterina Zorawskaya from the Paris School of Economics, who will deliver the laudation tonight. At this point, I normally say, welcome to Munich, and people make some noise. Now, what are the Munich Lectures? The Munich Lectures were founded by our colleague and friend Hans-Werner Sinn, who also founded the Center for Economic Studies. Every year, the CES Council selects one of the world's leading scholars to be awarded the CES Distinguished Fellowship and to be invited to deliver the Munich Lectures. Matthew, you are the 28th Distinguished CES Fellow. The Munich Lectures honor an outstanding economist whose research is not only academically excellent, it should also be policy relevant and help us understand the real world. This certainly applies to Matthew's work. It deals with some of the key economic and political issues of our time, including things like political polarization, the media, or health policy questions. Exactly why Matthew's work is so outstanding and relevant will be explained to us by Ekaterina, who will deliver the laudation in a minute. Ekaterina Zorawskaya is Professor of Economics, as I said, at Paris School of Economics. Her research also focuses on political economy and the media. She's also a highly decorated economist, among other things. In 2018, she received the Birgit Grodal Award for significant contributions to the economics profession. Uh, now, after the lecture, there will be a Q&A session, which will be chaired by Davide Cantoni. Davide is Professor of Economics and Economic History at the Department of Economics here at the University of Munich. Many thanks to you, Davide, for moderating this discussion. I would also like to thank Marcus Henry Brown for leading us through this evening. And uh, last, but by no means least, I would like to thank our partner Munich Re for sponsoring this event. Munich Re has supported this lecture for many years and continued its support when the lecture was shifted online. We are very grateful for this support. 
Thank you very much and enjoy the laudation, the lecture and the discussion. Thank you so much, Clemens. It's time now for this evening's laudation, and we are honored to be joined by Professor Ekaterina Surovskaya, who is a professor of economics at the Paris School of Economics. Her research focuses on empirical political economics and the economics of media. She is the recipient of the Birgit Grodel Award 2018 as a European-based female economist who has made a significant contribution to the economics profession. So a warm welcome to Professor Ekaterina Soyovskaya. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. This is my great honor and pleasure to introduce Professor Matt Gensko and his work today. The reason is that the importance of Matthew Gensko's contribution to economic knowledge is simply hard to overstate. Without any exaggeration, I can say that Matthew Gensko is a co-founder of the field of modern political economics of media. Moreover, a distinguishing feature of Matthew Gensko's research is a remarkable combination of theoretical, empirical, and methodological contributions that shaped this field from different angles. A little over 20 years ago, when I graduated from grad school as a young political economist, the field of the economics of media was at its infancy. There was already some sense that uh, mass media should be important for political accountability, that media markets are concentrated throughout the world, and that control over media may bring significant private benefits. Yet, there existed essentially no knowledge of either the sources or the consequences of media biases, and we didn't know why and how the structure of media markets may affect key political outcomes. More importantly, we also had no analytical apparatus to approach these questions. This was at a time when Matt Gensko directed a professional theater company in New York City. Even though he majored in economics at Harvard College, his first passion was theater, and he pursued it for a while. Luckily for us, and for me personally, as I now work in the field Matthew has co-founded, he decided to come back to academia and do PhD in economics at Harvard. We would never know how important of a loss this was for the world of theater, but we can evaluate the impact of this decision on economics, because this is when the field of economics of media has started to transform. Key foundation structure for this transformation came from Matthew Gensko's work on media bias. He started this work in grad school and he developed it for the following decade. Together with his long-term collaborator, Jesse Shapiro, Matthew published a series of very important and uh, innovative papers that substantially advanced our understanding of the extent of the reasons for and the consequences of media bias in democracies. Due to the time constraints, I, cannot, I can highlight only a few examples of, of this important work. It all started with the first paper Matt and Jesse published 15 years ago, which provided theoretical insights about how media bias could arise, essentially as a result of the demand for news from rational consumers who are interested in getting accurate news. And also that happens in the media market where media are interested to establish a reputation for being accurate. The bias comes from the fact that consumers of media prefer sources consistent with their priors, simply because they think sincerely that those sources are more accurate. In turn, news outlets respond to this demand by catering news to the priors of consumers. A lot of theoretical literature on media bias by many different scholars was built on the foundations of this paper. Throughout the decade that followed, Matt with his co-author Jesse developed a number of theories that study different aspects of media bias and they also designed revolutionary methods of measuring it and conducted empirical tests that showed that their theories are basically right. For example, 
Matt and Jesse were the first to develop a methodology of measuring political bias of the media in an environment where all media outlets uh, claim to be accurate and independent. They applied this methodology to measuring bias in US daily newspapers. In particular, they analyzed how similar the language of each of uh, the new US newspapers uh, is to the speeches of the Republican and Democratic congressmen, taking into account the politicians' ideological scores. This methodology is now standard and has been applied to measure biases in other media. For example, it was instrumental for documenting an increase in polarization among US cable TV networks. Using their measure, uh, uh, for the newspaper bias, Matt and Jesse uh, showed that consumers do self-select into like-minded news and that, of course, their theory predicts would give newspapers an incentive to slant their content to the ideology of the readers. And then they show that U.S. daily newspapers do respond to these incentives. Overall, we learned from this important work that ideological differences between readers explain a very large part of the variation in the media bias across media outlets. The work of Matthew also provided important insights about how the competition between media outlets affects ideological diversity of media. Together with Jesse, he first showed theoretically that ideological differentiation is a rational strategy of news media because the news uh, outlets compete on the two-sided markets. In other words, they want to attract both the readers and advertisers. To test uh, this theoretical result, they compiled a historical data set of all US newspapers over 100 years and show that the level of local competition between newspapers indeed had an important effect on newspapers' ideological biases as well as their stated ideological leanings. Matt's work also generated important insights on the political effects of media. He has documented that newspapers and television, for, for instance, had drastically different uh, political effects. In particular, newspaper entry on the local market has a large positive effect on voter turnout. In contrast, uh, the introduction of television significantly depressed voter turnout and worsened political knowledge of the voters. This, is, uh, this happened because uh, the voters switched from uh, consuming newspapers and radio with relatively large political content to entertainment TV, making TV one of the most important factors explaining a uh, decline in turnout since the uh, 1950s. Overall, this work changed how we think about the role of traditional media. As Matthew was always interested in how technological advances in media change political outcomes, with the emergence of internet and social media, the focus of his research moved uh, to the effects of new digital media. This research resulted also in a series of very influential papers, sometimes with the same, sometimes with different set of co-authors. This research produced an important set of results about the circulation of fake news on social media, the relationship between political polarization and the notorious echo chambers in social media, the presence of addiction to mobile devices, and the welfare effects of social media. As I believe today's lecture will be about this subject, I will not talk about uh, these results, uh, even though I am very interested in this research and uh, uh, learn a lot from these results. Instead, in conclusion, I would like to report the results of a little empirical exercise I conducted in preparing for today. As I'm profoundly an empirical person, uh, I aimed at getting empirical support to my today's proposition that the work of Matthew Gensko has transformed the field of political economy of media. In order to do this, I conducted a small survey among economists working on media. To construct my sample, I took one of author at random from each of the papers featured in the two recent surveys of the literature on political economy of media and social media. In order to avoid framing effects, I removed from the sample all participants of the workshop in honor of Matthew that will follow today's lecture. This ensured that the respondents didn't know the reason for my survey.
Then I mailed the rest of the sample a single question. Could you please give two names of the economists who made uh, the most important contribution to economics of media in the last 15 years? In order not to put the respondents in the awkward position, I stipulated that the rule is that they cannot give their own name or my name. And then the response rate was 73% over about three days, and the results of this poll yield a strong consensus in the profession. Out of those who responded, 88% named Matthew Gensko. There was no consensus on the other name. It should not come as a surprise to anybody that there is no consensus on the, let's say, second name, simply because there are many important contributions by different people to this vibrant and exciting field. This makes the question that I asked in the survey a really hard question. The fact that there is a consensus on the name of Matthew Gensko is remarkable, precisely for the same reason. This shows how important the impact of Matt Gensko's work has been. This is, of course, uh, reflected also in the numerous awards and honors that Matt Gensko has received throughout his career, including the John Bates Clark Medal, which happened in which he, which he was awarded in 2014, which is one of the two most prestigious prizes in economics. He remains prolific uh, scholar uh, even after that prize, and actually his most cited work was written after that award. Overall, I'm looking forward to the lecture of this brilliant and amazing score. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Zuevskaya. We'll be hearing from Ekaterina again during the Q&A session. We've now reached the part of the evening which, unfortunately, is almost impossible to do virtually. But, uh, we've tried doing this a couple of times, uh, haven't we, Clements? And I think we're getting quite good at it now. So I'll hand back to Clements, who is joined now uh, by Matthew Genskarl, the Distinguished CES Fellow 2021. Thank you very much, Marcus. Now, it's a pleasure for me to... Uh, start this award ceremony and as Marcus said we would normally hand over uh, the award which takes the form of this plate I can only show to you now Matthew we will send this by mail but what I can do and what I'm very happy to do is read the uh, prize certificate uh, to you and uh, to all of us uh, so the Center for Economic Studies of Ludwig Maximilian Universität Munich awards under the auspices of the Dean of the economics faculty, Florian Engelmeyer, and after selection by the CES Council uh, to Matthew Gansko, London Professor of Technology and the Economy at Stanford University, the prize as this year's distinguished CES Fellow and nominates him to give the Munich Lectures in Economics 2021. With this award, the Center for Economic Studies honors Matthew Gansko's significant contributions to the research of media industry. So it's a, it's a great honor that you uh, deliver these lectures, Matthew. Thank you very much for doing this and congratulations to this prize. Thank you. Thank you so much, Clemens. It's a huge honor to receive this. I, uh, you know, thanks to the Center for Economic Studies, to you, to Marcus, to everybody who was part of putting this together. It's a really extraordinary event. And I think it's one of the few events like this that really has a lot of intellectual heft and exploration behind it. Uh, we have a whole workshop tomorrow, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, I want to give a special thanks to Katya. It, you know, everything she said about me, I could say about her as well and her pioneering work in this field, which has really uh, revolutionized, particularly the study of media outside the U.S. Um, and special thanks to Davide also, who will be part of the Q&A later and who's done a huge amount of work to organize this. So thank you so much to everyone. Thank you, Matthew. And we are now very keen to hear your lecture. Thank you. Back to you, Marcus. Thank you, Clemens. And congratulations uh, from me as well. So yes, it's time now for the Munich lecture. And a quick reminder that you can post any questions you may have um, about Matthew's lecture using the Slido link. So quick recap. Matthew Genskalm, 
is Landau Professor of Technology and the Economy at Stanford University and a senior fellow at the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research, the SIEPR. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the Econometric Society. In 2014, he received the John Bates Clark Medal. His research focuses on applied microeconomics with a focus on the media industry. This evening, Professor Genskow will be sharing his research, his findings, and his ideas with his 2021 Munich lecture, which is called Digital Media and Social Good. Thank you so much. It's great to get to be here and give the Munich lecture for this year. I want to talk about some research on the topic of digital media and its impact on well being. I think it's a good place to start for thinking about this to remember that not that long ago, seems like a very long time ago, but not that long ago, a lot of the conversation around social media's impact on the world was about the good things that it might be doing. There was, I, I think if you go back and think about it, the idea of a technology that would allow people to connect with others all over the globe, that would make it easier to keep in touch with your family and friends, that would allow you to find people with common interests and um, who share similar uh, things that they love or things that they hate or things that they're struggling with in life, all of that might, we would think, be a really good thing for the world. And in particular, would be a really good thing for people's own well-being and happiness and mental health. Um, we know that, that connections with other people and uh, are, are one of the most important drivers of well-being and happiness. So that all seemed uh, pretty promising once upon a time. Obviously, the picture today looks very different, and a lot of the conversation around social media is around the potential harmful effects that it has. Um, one whole part of that conversation is about the possibility that it has addictive properties, that people are gonna find themselves using these technologies more than they should or in, in different ways than is best for them. And there's also been a really important conversation specifically about the impact of social media and digital technologies on teenagers and younger people. Um, so recently, as I'm sure many of you know, there was a lot of internal documents released from Facebook, which prompted a discussion of what Facebook, Facebook knew about the impact that Instagram had on teens. Um, and Francis Haugen, the, the whistleblower who released those documents recently testified before the US Congress, I think um, recently also testified uh, before Parliament in the UK. So th th there is a big and important conversation um, about the potential harmful effects of social media. And I, I think coming at that conversation from the outside, an observation is that the evidence we have on those effects has, for the most part, been quite limited. Um, and I would take this, this Instagram question and, and the Facebook files document release as an example, all of this news coverage about um, Facebook knowing that Instagram has harmful effects on teen girls is largely based on internal research at Facebook. It was basically a, a couple of surveys that were done of teens asking them how Instagram made them feel and focusing particularly on teens who had said that they have some body image issues or other mental health health issues. Um, this shows the, the kind of key findings from that internal study. And so these are this was a survey, and this is the result specifically for teen girls, where they were asked for each of these issues on the left, eating issues, sleep issues, body image, FOMO means fear of missing out, social comparison, and so on. Would you say that Instagram made that worse, didn't change it at all, or made it better? Um, and so you can see those results. 
all of these headlines that said, Facebook knew that Instagram makes body images, body image issues worse for teen girls. It's based on the fact that 32% of teen girls said that body image uh, issues they have is made worse by using Instagram. None of that coverage mentioned that 22% say that Instagram makes those issues better. 46% said it had no impact. And that if we look across this larger set of things that we might also be concerned about, fear of missing out, social comparison, eating disorders, loneliness, anxiety, sadness, and so on. In almost all of those cases, teen girls say that Instagram, more of them say Instagram makes it better than say makes it worse. Um, so that kind of evidence is obviously not definitive either way, but I think it would be clear, hopefully to everybody that taking from this, that we know Instagram has a very harmful causal effect on net would be a big leap. Um, and so what I, what I wanna focus on today is research some of it by me and also touch on and, and, and a number of important collaborators and then also talk, touch on some work by others um, that's just trying to get closer to causal credible estimates of these kinds of effects. Um, and I want to emphasize, I'll, I'll kind of focus here on these studies that I've done, but um, there are lots of other papers being written, lots of other work pushing the frontier on this topic. And I think the, I think the exciting thing today in some sense is the tools for economic research that we have available today mean we can make progress on this question and, and find good, credible evidence in a way that was not possible in the past. So here's what I wanna talk about uh, today in the time that we have. I wanna step back and think a little bit about the historical context for this new technology. I'll talk about an experiment that my co-authors and I did looking at what happens if we randomly assign people to deactivate their Facebook accounts. Talk about some more recent research we did looking using an experiment at trying to measure the extent to which social media is addictive. Um, and then also talk briefly about some exciting new work that is not mine, but looking specifically at mental health effects on teens. Okay. So let's start with historical context. I think one of the, the valuable perspectives one might have on smartphones and social media as a new technology is to think about them in the scale of how much they've changed the way we use our time. There are a lot of different ways you could think about what is a big innovation, what is a small innovation. You could think about how do they impact life expectancy? How do they impact people's standard of living? But one that we sometimes miss is how much have, have they reshaped the day-to-day -day experience of life? That is how, how we spend the scarce hours and minutes of our days. And if you think about things that way, you know, the, the 20th century saw a number of really dramatic and important innovations that really affected the shape of people's lives. And a lot of those included changes in media, the introduction of radio, that people were spending an hour per day listening to the radio at, at, at the peak of that. Um, and especially the one that really stands out is television. Television was an unprecedented change in the way people use their leisure time. Very quickly, within a few years after television was introduced in the late 1940s, early 1950s, people who had televisions were spending three to four hours a day watching TV. That's just like an enormous share of people's leisure time. And actually over the second half of the 20th century, as improved productivity and uh, better labor standards and so on, reduced the amount of time that people spent working, almost all of the extra leisure time that they gained through those changes went into watching uh, television, as Eric Hurst and Mark Aguiar and others have shown. So, so up until very recently, TV stood out as this kind of unprecedented change in our lives. I would say that smartphones and social media are really the first thing since television that registers on that same kind of scale. Um, 
the estimates are sort of all over the place and it depends how you count. But um, on average in the US or Europe, people are spending something like three hours per day uh, using their smartphone, maybe an hour or more a day using social media specifically. Um, so that's just an enormous change. And I think what I would, what I would note is those innovations that change the way we use our time, reshape our kind of day-to-day -day experience of life tend to go along with both outsized, dramatic optimism about the ways that they might change the world for the better and outsized fear about the way that they may be harming us. And these things basically happen reliably like clockwork every time there is a new innovation like this. Um, and so we have these, these fears and these hopes, but it has until very recently been difficult to go beyond that and measure the real impacts. So this is a quote from Douglas Adams, the author of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which I love. Anything in the world that is there when you're born is normal and ordinary and just a natural part of the way the world works. Anything that's invented between when you're 15 and 35 is new and exciting and revolutionary. You can probably get a career in it. Anything invented after that is against the natural order of things and is probably destroying the world in some way. I think that captures pretty well the reaction that we've had over time to media innovations. If you go back over the record, you know, you can you can go back even further than this, but if you started with radio, when radio was introduced, this was this new device that was sitting in people's homes where adults and children both were spending you know, hour or more per day uh, listening to it. And there were lots of these worries about what it might doing, what it might be doing. The, the popularity of radio among children has increased rapidly. This new invader of the privacy of the home has brought many a disturbing influence in its wake. Parents are bewildered. They find themselves helpless. They can't lock out this intruder because it has gained an invincible hold on their children. Television then, of course, was an even larger uh, concern and, and the, the things written about the potential negative effects that television might have on kids were even more dramatic. I think, it, and I think in, as we think about social media and smartphones, it's really helpful to put that in perspective, to kind of go back and remember what we were saying about television. So um, there were a couple of very specific concerns about the way these hours and hours people were spending with TV. One was specifically that this is kind of passive time, that you're just sitting there, not doing anything, zoned out, watching TV, it's mindless, and that it might have this addictive property as a result. Um, like the sorcerer of old, the television set casts its magic spell, freezing speech and action, turning the living into silent statues, just kind of zoned out watching. And a separate concern is that this is also time that people are spending alone rather than together. The primary danger of the television screen lies not so much in the behavior it produces as in the behavior it prevents. The talks, the games, the family festivities and arguments through which much of a child's learning takes place. Turning on the television set can turn off the process that transforms children into people. Um, so this is, you know, these are quotes from a book focused on TV's effect on kids, but you could you could say a lot of the same things. A lot of the same concerns were expressed for its effect on adults. So I, what, what I'd like all of you to just pause and reflect on for a second is, given that background, do we think that smartphones, social media are going to have similar impacts to television? Are they going to be different? Are they going to be better? Are they going to be worse? It's, I, I, I kind of have this image that if we went back and talked to somebody in you know, 1978 or 1985, who was really focused and concerned about the impacts that television was having on people and took those concerns that we just talked about in those quotes seriously, you said to that person, what if in 2021, the technology that, that kids were spending all their time with was one where instead of sitting mindlessly and passively just zoned out watching, what they actually do is record videos and edit those videos and share those with their friends and take photos and post them and so on. 
what if instead of a solitary activity where they were just sitting there alone, it was actually an activity where they were connecting with others, where they were interacting, sending messages, sending videos, and so on. Um, somebody might have said, like, boy, that sounds like it's going to be great. What, what a tremendous improvement um, relevant, re relative to television. So, you know, has it, is, is that right? Has it instead played out to be much worse? I think it's, it's really hard to know ex ante and it's hard to know from the anecdotal evidence that we see. I think what's, what's important and exciting is then to try to drill down and look at um, some more direct causal evidence to try to understand. So let me talk now about the first of these experiments that, that we did. So the first one is a paper called The Welfare Effects of Social Media that was an experiment we did in 2018 that was published in 2020. And this is joint work with my amazing co-authors, Hunt Alcott, Luca Braghieri, and Sarah Eichmeier. So what we did in this study was recruit a sample of about 3,000 US Facebook users. We recruited them online, actually on Facebook, using Facebook ads. And in order to be eligible for the experiment, they people needed to say that they would be willing to deactivate their Facebook account for four weeks in exchange for a payment of about $100. And so if people consented to the experiment and said they would be willing to do that, they were then randomized into a treatment at a control group. If you were in the control group, you just continued using Facebook as usual, but completed the various surveys that were part of the study. If you were part of the treatment group, you deactivated your Facebook account for a period of four weeks. And these were the four weeks leading up to the 2018 midterm election in the US. And so in the context of this study, we wanted to look at a number of things. It's like, once you go to all the work to set up an experiment like this, where you have people um, doing this month long kind of detox from Facebook, you'd like to look at a whole range of issues. So that includes questions about happiness and self-reported well-being. We also are looking in this study at other issues that are you know, not so much the focus of what I'm talking about today, like political impacts of Facebook, how, how being off of Facebook might change polarization, knowledge of the news and so on. Um, and we also look at when people who had been previously spending a lot of time on Facebook aren't doing that, where does that time go? What do they shift to doing instead? Um, and that's really important if you think about these questions about, you know, is this, is this the time that people spend on social media reducing the amount of interactions that they have with other people if the time they spend on Facebook would otherwise be spent mostly sitting alone uh, by themselves? then it could really be increasing their social interactions. If instead, the time they're spending on Facebook is crowding out face-to-face -face time that they would otherwise be spending with their friends and family, then that could be a very different picture. So the, the timeline of this experiment looked like this. In 2018, we recruited people in September and October. They completed a recruitment survey, they had to pass some screening questions, and then there was a baseline survey where we measured baseline values of a lot of the outcome variables we're interested in. And they had to go away and come back a week later, complete another survey, and that was the point at which they were randomized into treatment and control. Then they had this four week, the, the four week period of deactivation for the treatment group ran from October 11th to November 8th. We had an inline survey on November 8th, and then a follow up survey a month later on December 3rd. We also, as part of this measurement of, of subjective well-being, in addition to these survey questions, which were things like, you know, asking you over the last four weeks, would you say overall you felt happy or not so happy? Did you feel satisfied with your life? Did you feel anxious or lonely or depressed? Things like that. These text message surveys were also um, measuring the same kind of things in real time. So instead of answering that retrospectively on a survey, you would get a text message that says basically, how happy do you feel right now? Or do you feel lonely right now? The deactivation part of this, just to note, it, it, importantly, 
you can deactivate your Facebook account. When you do that, it, it disables everything on your account, but you, all that stuff stays there so you can come back and reactivate it later. So these people were not losing all of their contacts and photos and content on their Facebook accounts. And importantly, we were able to monitor whether they deactivated their accounts because when your account is deactivated, the URL associated with your account returns an error message. So we could basically ping those URLs and verify deactivation. So here are the main results from that experiment, just to summarize. Um, so, so people who were in the treatment group uh, and did this 30-day detox from Facebook, first of all, they did indeed report increased face-to-face -face time with family and friends. So when we looked at this question that, you know, the people who were in this study, um, because we recruited them on Facebook, they're a little bit heavier Facebook users than the, the overall population. And we required to be in the study that you use, say that you use Facebook at least 15 minutes per day. Given that the average person in the experiment was somebody who, who actually uses Facebook for about an hour a day. So, if you get assigned to the treatment group, you turn off Facebook and you basically get back an extra hour. And so you could think about what do we expect that people might do with that extra hour? One possibility would be they would substitute a lot of it to other social media. Another possibility is that they might substitute a lot of it to other digital activities like watching YouTube videos or playing video games or something else. The really interesting finding here is we don't see either of those things. In fact, when people are off of Facebook, they actually report using other social media less and other digital activities like um, playing video games on their computers less. So it's actually like you're, you're doing less on your devices overall if you're off of Facebook. That sort of makes sense if you think about maybe people are just taking their phones out of their pockets less, they're not getting all these notifications from Facebook. What that means is that they're actually shifting more than an hour of time away from digital activities toward um, offline, non-digital activities. And that includes stuff alone, like watching TV or sitting, reading a book or um, so on, as well as uh, a lot of different activities that people report with family and friends. So that's fact number one, which I think is pretty important. It confirms that Facebook use really does crowd out time with family and friends. Second, people report on these measures of happiness and well-being is kind of the core thing for what we're talking about today, that they are, in fact, the people in the treatment group report being happier. So when you're off of Facebook, you report being happier overall on average. And consistent with that, if you went through this 30-day period off of Facebook, you then actually use Facebook less in the future. And we can measure that directly to some extent using people's um, tracking of their time using the screen time app on iOS. So all of that is pretty consistent, I think, as direct experimental evidence of the view that there are some harmful effects of Facebook use on well-being and, and mental health. Um, I would flag, though, that it's also true that everybody in this experiment reports valuing access to Facebook very highly. So the, the average person in the experiment says that they, they're in, in an incentivized question where there's real money on the line, that they're willing to pay about $100 a month to use Facebook. And we did a whole lot of qualitative interviews and follow-ups with the people who were part of this experiment. It was very clear that while it's true that a lot of people found this time off of Facebook beneficial and, and, and reported being happier, they also, there were many things also about Facebook that they missed. There were many people who said that that they really missed out on social connections, that, that they weren't able to continue or to make. There were people who said things like, uh, you know, my son's away at college and he was having a birthday party and I couldn't look and see, you know, the pictures from his party. So it, it's important to think about Facebook as really a bundle of a lot of different things. The m extra minutes on the margin I think that people are using this suggests really are not making them happier on net, but there's a lot of other time and minutes that are spending that, that may be valuable. Okay, so that's one experiment. Second is uh, 
more recent experiment that we did in kind of a similar spirit, drilling down specifically on the issue of digital addiction. Um, and so this is with Hunt Alcott and Lena Song, who's a fantastic PhD student at NYU. And the structure of this experiment is similar, but a bit different. So we recruited about 2000 users of Android. We were focused on Android users because we, we built a custom app for this experiment that only works on Android. So we needed Android users. And if you wanna be part of the experiment, you install that app. It lets us measure how much you're using different apps on your phone. And it also lets us give you the option to set limits on your use. Um, and those limits, importantly, unlike something like screen time on iOS or digital well-being features that are built into Android, those limits can be hard. They can, we can make them strict limits. So if you run out of time, you really can't keep using an app until the next day. We then, for this experiment, use two different treatments. One is a screen time bonus where we sort of like in the Facebook experiment, in this case, we pay you something per minute that you reduce your usage over a period of time. Second, independently randomized, we give some people access to this commitment device of these limits uh, that lets them limit their own use. And in, in this experiment, we're thinking about a model of addiction, which builds on literature in behavioral economics. In that model, addiction really consists of two key pieces. The first is habit formation, which just means an addictive good. If I get you to use more of it today, you're going to tend to want to use more of it in the future. Like if I give you some heroin today, your demand for heroin in the future is going to be higher. If I reduce your heroin today, demand is going to be lower. So there's that habit formation piece. And the other piece is what in the behavioral literature might be called temptation, which is that when I make decisions in the present about how much heroin to take or how many cigarettes to smoke or how much gambling to do if I'm a gambling addict, I'm tempted to consume more than I would ideally like to from a long-term perspective. So those two key pieces are what define addiction in our model. And these two treatments, the screen time bonus and the limits, let us get at each of those two things. The screen time bonus gives a temporary incentive for a few weeks to reduce your use of social media. We can then see whether that has persistent effects suggestive of habit formation. And the limits are something that if you're perfectly rational and don't have any temptation, you shouldn't really want to use. But if you do have temptation or self-control problems, those limits should be effective in, in, in reducing your use and there's something you should want to take up. So we'll then measure effects on screen time and self-reported well-being and addiction. This experiment took place in 2020. People re were recruited in March to April. Now, you might remember that March to April 2020 was not exactly the most ordinary uh, time for the world. So one kind of caveat with this whole experiment is it's, it's sort of sitting against the backdrop of the COVID crisis. Um, and, I, and we just have to take that into account, I think, when interpreting the results. There was a midline survey on May 3rd and a series of later surveys and we're able to follow people's usage all the way up um, until July 26th. The experiment focuses on a set of six apps here. So the other one was just Facebook. This is Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, browsers like Chrome and also YouTube. Um, and this is just to give you an idea of what this app, our app was called Phone Dashboard. It, it looks sort of like screen time. You can see each app, how much time you used, and you can also set limits. Um, so we asked people a bunch of questions at baseline about how they felt about their phone use. And one thing just off the bat is it's very clear that a large share of people, not everybody, but maybe 60% or more people um, would like to use their phone less than they really do. And on a number of different questions express this sense that they are themselves addicted. When we then put things through the lens of this experiment, we find significant evidence of both habit formation and temptation. We find evidence of habit formation because these bon this bonus that, that we get people to reduce their usage of these Fitzby apps for three weeks, that then has long-term persistent effects where they continue to use it less. That's consistent with what we saw in the other experiment too. And there are large effects of giving people these limits. So just offering them the option to set binding limits on themselves reduces their usage by about 20%. When we look at that through the lens of our model, it says digital addiction is very real. 
And that if we turned that off, or in particular, if we turned off the temptation, kind of non-rational part of, of addiction, people would be using those social media apps about 30% less. So something like a third of the time that people are spending on those Fitzby apps might be a consequence of addiction as we define it. Okay, now in the last couple of minutes, um, all of that is about uh, experiments involving a broad population of, of adults, basically. Um, none of it speaks directly to these issues of what's going on with teenagers, although I think the results are suggestive of the kind of things that we might expect. Um, we have been trying, me and my co-authors have been trying for a long time to work out a design that would allow us to get more directly at those effects and have basically completely failed at that. You've, you know, it turns out to be really hard to recruit younger populations for these kinds of experiments. You have to get parental consent and so on. Um, and so I just wanted to highlight um, the, some, some recent work on this. So this is just, um, again, noting the, the broad public discussion about the, these harmful effects on teens. This is a screenshot from a book by Jean Twenge that really emphasizes correlational evidence that suggests that. What I want to highlight is this awesome recent paper by um, Luca Braghieri, who is some of your colleague there in Munich and one of my students, former Stanford PhD student, along with Roy Levy and Alexei Makarin. Um, this is just a beautiful paper that I think is the first compelling causal evidence we have on the impact of Facebook, in this case, on mental health. So this is not a randomized experiment. It's going back and finding a natural experiment in the data related to the rollout of Facebook across US colleges. Facebook was introduced in, in different months in different US colleges. And so depending on where you were in school, which cohort you were in, you might or might not have had exposure to Facebook before you graduate. And they've connected this to surveys that were done at the time with really detailed information on mental health um, for those college students, including things like, have they you know, had a visit to the health services for mental health reasons? Do they themselves perceive themselves to be struggling with depression or other issues and so on? And the really striking finding is there is clear and substantial increases in mental health problems, difficulties when Facebook is introduced. Those effects look really robust and strong and clear. The, the authors do a lot of work to really isolate the causal part of that and make it um, convincing. And then there's suggestive evidence that that also went along with uh, some negative effects on academic performance. And they, in looking at the mechanisms, conclude that at least some evidence points toward this social comparison channel where suddenly everybody was on Facebook um, aware of how their Facebook page looks relative to their peers. You have to remember that Mark Zuckerberg at Harvard, when he first introduced Facebook, the original thing was uh, something where you could like compare photos of you and your peers and you could vote on who's better looking than who else. So it was all about social comparisons to begin with. And that seems to be maybe at the, at the heart of these impacts. Okay. So bottom line, I think I wanna keep reminding us in the background that there are substantial benefits that social media provides to many users. And none of what I'm talking about today goes so far as to quantify those total effects or can tell us whether the overall impact of Facebook on the world is, is positive or negative. However, the evidence is clear that these addictive properties are very real, that exactly the same behavioral mechanisms that we see with other addictive goods really are at work with social media, and that if we get people to reduce their usage of social media, that does increase their well being. Moreover, this, especially the recent work by Luca and Roy and Alexei, really, I think, convinces us that these potential harms to mental health of teens are real and serious. Although, as I would emphasize, the quality of the evidence that comes through in the public discussion is often very, very poor. So hopefully that evidence in the public discussion can be dramatically improved by studies like that one. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you all very much. And I look forward to um, discussing, answering questions.
Thank you so much, uh, Professor Gensko, for that fascinating and timely lecture. It's time now for the Q&A part of the evening with Professor Davide Cantoni from the LMU here in Munich, who will be moderating the next session with Clemens, Matthew and Ekaterina. So take a breath, let that all settle. I'm sure you have some questions. Um, and as I've mentioned throughout the event, we're using Slido tonight. So by using this link, you can share your thoughts, your ideas, and your questions with us if you haven't already. So with that, it's time to start the Q&A. Welcome. Welcome, everybody. Thank you, Matthew, for your lecture. Thanks for organizing everything, Clemens, the whole CS team, and thanks, Katya, for the introduction of Matthew. So I, I really enjoyed the lecture. It was a great intellectual uh, experience, both, you know, having first introduction by, by Katya, giving us a lot of context and giving us also, I, I thought, a very good way of thinking about your research. Um, and also your, your presentation, you know, I, I liked very much your your historical comparisons with TV, of course, being an economic historian, uh, that was uh, very fascinating. And, and you know, your your time journey, asking people back in the seventies what they would have thought about 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 you know the social media today, is indeed an interesting uh, thought experiment. So, um, as you know, we're using a Slido, this this tool. Um, I will be moderating uh, the discussion. Please uh, remember to use, if if you don't mind, your your name. So, unfortunately, Slido does not have as a default that you should. Username. I, I get a lot of interesting questions, but they're all by anonymous. I'm very happy to to relate questions by anonymous, but I would be even happier if you could give me your name and I could relay your questions to to Matthew or, of course, to Katya as well. Um, if you give me your full name, um, so um, uh, you know, uh, I see there's a lot of activity going on on Slido. So if, if you see me distracted, it's because I'm switching back and forth between checking what you're posting on Slido. Um, and, um, and, and what uh, you are answering. Um, so there's a question that um, uh, people have, um, have been asking, um, and you know, it goes back to your comparison that you made before a little bit about, about TV um, and, um, and social media. So the question is, um, and it's by an anonymous user, aren't most of users using social media passively by watching video and looking at posts? So isn't social media comparable more to classic media in this sense? And, if I may piggyback on, on this question, I'm also a little bit wondering, what do we make of, of, of the differences between social media? So between more, uh, you know, social media like, like Facebook, of course, that was the subject of your experiment, uh, but other social media that, uh, you know, have, have been more popular among younger generations now, like, you know, first Instagram and, and, and TikTok uh, now. Yeah, great. Yeah. Thanks, David. Um, um, thanks for the question. I think, I think it's a really good one. I think it's not. I think it's not. Does everybody hear that Does echo? Everybody hear no? that echo or no? You want to take a second? Take a second. So I, I'll turn else off my sure own. They're... I think maybe if everybody else makes sure their mics are muted, that'll help. Um, yeah. So it's a it's it's a great question, and I think for sure there's a lot of passive use of social media, and one way you could look at this is that um, indeed they're not so different. I do think that that. Compared to television, the amount of time that people spend on social media that is not passive, that is either responding to things, posting things, creating things, um, particularly in, in the way younger people use it, you know, a lot of that time is on chat apps and communicating uh, with other people. It, th this was a, a, a real focus at Facebook several years ago around the time that we were designing that original Facebook experiment, and it was something we talked to the people there a lot about was the idea that maybe you could divide the time people spend on Facebook into passive uses, like just scrolling through your newsfeed and separately, um, you know, more active uses like posting things, posting reactions and so forth. And that, that maybe it was the, the passive use that was the problem. And if we broke those out, we'd see different effects. Um, and so we actually, explored that in the study, we, we separated users into those who reported at baseline using it more passively or more actively. And we didn't actually see much difference in terms of the, the main effects we saw. These reductions in happiness, as well as some of the effects we saw in polarization were pretty similar for those two groups. So 
I think I think it's right that there's a difference. I also think that it, it's not clear from the evidence that um, even the more active parts of that usage are not um, having these these problematic effects. And it's actually something that's come back into the discussion with these Facebook files leaks that um, one of the things that Facebook did as a response to that was try to upweight content that was generating active interaction. They wanted what they called meaningful social interactions. They were boosting content that led people to post comments or likes or reactions. And some of the internal research that's been released as part of that leak shows that that, that content actually often is the most problematic, some of the most problematic content that like what generates reactions actually turns out to be more extreme content that's more political, that has um, more negative potentially effects. Uh, okay, so so the next question is uh, by Wojta Bartos. So he's asking, how did people change their behavior on social media when choosing, when they had their time constrained on there? Were you able to measure the change in behavior under these constraints? Yeah, a little bit. Um, it, it, you know, we don't have we don't have a great ability to to look at everything that people are doing, and particularly a limitation of these studies is that we can't see in detail what people are doing off of their devices, so how they're you know switching to other activities on their laptops or um, elsewhere. But we saw we saw kind of a mix in in that addiction study. So when we paid people to reduce their use. Um, we had these two treatment groups. So one, one where they were directly paid to reduce their use and the other one where they had access to these limit um, functionalities. And it was a little different between those two treatment groups. In one of them, you saw people's use of other, um, other apps on their phone kind of in total actually went down while they were reducing their use consistent with what we saw in the Facebook study. And then in the other, treatment, it went um, a little bit the other way. So it's kind of a mixed bag. I think this is something where more work with better data would be um, really helpful because I think these substitution effects, you know, how people shift around their usage are really important in understanding the impacts. The impact of social media would be very different if what people would be doing instead was, you know, spending quality time with their friends and family or watching, reading really high quality news outlets. That's often what academics like to imagine. You know, if everybody wasn't spending time on TikTok, they would all be um, reading <laughs> or something. Um, you know, that world is very different from one where all that time just goes into um, other activities that are similar. So I think I think it's we, we have kind of a hint of that in this experiment, but it would be a great thing to study more. Uh, so, so another question uh, from uh, Nicola Chitega from Toronto is uh, about about the gender dimension in this. So we know that the Facebook files were especially referring to teen girls. Um, he's asking actually the other way around. So may the effects be gender specific? And he's thinking about teen males. So he's thinking about video games, access to porn, and so on. So does that affect um, you know schooling, labor decisions for young males? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So I, I think first, just narrowly in terms of the research that we've done, in, in the experiments that I described, the, the Facebook quitting experiment and the addiction experiment, we don't see um, particular diff, particularly large differences by gender. So most of the effects that I'm talking about turn out in this adult sample that we have in those experiments turn out to be pretty similar um, for men and for women. I don't I don't believe in, in Luca and Roy and Alexei's Facebook and mental health study, which I mentioned. Um, I don't remember whether they see any gender differences. I don't recall um, them talking about, but but I think that would be an interesting question. There is then a whole uh, some some separate, really interesting research looking at um, particularly the effect of video games, uh, which is something that is heavily male, and so. Eric Hurst and Mark Aguiar and others have done some work arguing. I think I think it's a you know tough thing to really nail down, but but showing evidence that suggests that video games have actually had a meaningful impact on labor force participation, and there have been declines o over time in labor force participation, particularly of young men, and that a significant part of that might be due to the fact that video games make leisure time for those groups a lot more appealing. Um, 
And so, so I think I think video games really are a specific piece of this that that is different different because of this gender dimension, different otherwise. I have an 11 year old son uh, who spends a lot of time playing video games, so I'm pretty attuned to how interesting this is, and it's it's something we didn't we didn't really get at in our studies at all, and I think um, is is an open area to really try to learn more about. Um, so, you know, reflecting a little bit, I think the, the, the behavioral econ group here in Munich and continental Europe, I've, I have a lot of questions about, about the behavioral mechanism. So I will um, relay at least one of them. So one is, um, actually, I might combine two. Um, one is, uh, will the commitment device, this is by anonymous users, sorry. Uh, will, the, will the commitment device really only be binding when there is temptation? And what about people wrongly estimating their optimal usage time? Yeah, so I think I think so. Just to rewind, I guess for for everybody, you know, so the so commitment device here refers to the these limits that we're making available in this experiment. So in the experiment, we gave people access to this feature and this app on their Android phones, where they could choose to um, set limits on those. Uh, devices and so you can pick how many minutes you want to allow yourself to use Facebook and have your use cut off when that's done. So that's a commitment device in the sense that it lets you today commit yourself tomorrow to limit your usage. And that's interesting in the context of temptation because the whole idea with temptation, at least the way it's thought about in behavioral economics, is it's a difference between what you would like to do when you think about your behavior in the future and what you end up doing when you actually get to that moment um, tomorrow. And so I, I think it's right that the, the demand for those commitment devices is going to tend to be for people who um, have temptation. That's kind of what we're trying to capture in the experiment. And, and, but also in particular, it's only going to matter for people who have temptation and are kind of sophisticated about it. Like they realize that they're using more than they would like to. And so they're able to think ahead and say, wow, I better I would, I would actually really like to put some limits on myself tomorrow because of that temptation. So I think that's consistent with what we see in the survey evidence at the baseline of this study, where a lot of people, as I showed you in that, in that graph, a lot of people do say they would like to limit their usage. They wish that they spent less time on their phones than they really do. Um, that was kind of what motivated us. So I think, I think that is in, in the context of the model we estimate there, that is what we back out as like, how much temptation is there and also how sophisticated are people about it in terms of people misestimating it i think that's a really interesting question one of the things you would expect to see if people are misestimating the degree of temptation is that the effect of this might change over time like as as people have more experience using those limits they might realize um, that you know it's not playing out the way they expected and and adjust their behavior. We don't really see much evidence of that. The the impact of these limits is actually very stable, and the time period here is pretty long. Like we have, you know, nine weeks or so that we're able to observe people. Um, so we don't see a lot of that learning. But I think I think you know understanding more about the extent to which people are misestimating things is also really interesting. So uh, there are a couple of other questions that you know, could be related to, to this point, especially about, you know, what, what happens afterwards. So one user at Maxim Minert is asking, uh, did you measure why people reduce their social media usage even after the paid period? Was it a conscious decision or an unconscious process? And, uh, you know, I think a related question also goes a little bit towards this, this behavioral psychological mechanism is asked by another user who's asking, uh, did people get happier because they quit Facebook or was it just this enjoyment of the self-commitment so did they were they happy that they enjoyed it that they succeeded in the self-commitment just like they succeeded in training for a marathon mm. great um yeah so so on the first thing what you know why did people reduce their usage after the end of of the facebook quitting experiment we you know we found that a particularly interesting result um it's quite dramatic you know it's something like a 20 percent reduction in how many minutes people are spending on Facebook after the end of the experiment. So it really looks like the experiment, the experience of having this 30 minute detox um, changes people's use, changes how much they value Facebook, leads them to want to use it less. And it's nice in the context of the experiment because unlike a lot of these 
outcomes like the happiness stuff and other things we're measuring that that all have to be measured by surveys and surveys have you know various issues and problems associated with them this is something we can measure directly we can see how quickly people reactivate their facebook accounts and we can also use the the screen time measurement on their phone to get at least a, a more accurate measure um, so it's i think it's a, a striking finding in terms of the mechanisms for it and how it happened was it deliberate the nice thing here is as i mentioned we did a lot of interviews with the participants here and there was actually a, a team of qualitative researchers who wrote up a separate paper just about their interviews with people and and the experience they had and i think what stands out if you look at the transcripts of all of those interviews is a lot of people say describe that that they now realize that the way they were using facebook before was not ideal and they want to make changes they want to use it less so based qualitatively on those interviews it really does look deliberate a lot of people i think learn something from the experience and importantly like very few of those people are saying i learned i never want to use facebook again that's not what you hear by and large what you hear is i learned that a lot of the time i was spending on facebook was not really so good for me and what i want to do is go back to using facebook and try to to use it more effectively to to you know use it for the the group that I founded to do some social activism and to keep in touch with my kids who are at college, but not to spend hours and hours, you know, scrolling through political content on my newsfeed or whatever else. So that comes through very clearly in people's responses that they learn something, they want to make a change. And that change is not, not to get rid of Facebook, not that it's providing no value to them, but that they want to change the mix of what they're doing. We're about halfway through our Q&A, so keep the questions coming. I see, I see them coming up on Slido, but please uh, keep asking questions. Um, so let me look at um, the list of questions. It's working wonderfully. Uh, this platform works great. Um, so one user, Filip Milojevic, is asking about the specific context, of course, of, of your experiment of the COVID pandemic. As you said before, you know, there's nothing that you could have anticipated when you started planning the experiment. It would be rolled out in the midst of, of the ongoing, actually, of the starting pandemic last spring. Um, so, so Philip Milajevic is asking: Could the increase in screen time due to the COVID pandemic have made individuals more aware of their use of social media channels or digital goods in general? Yeah, great. Um, so, th this is a really important question. I wanted, to, by the way, I think David, I think I kind of skipped over the second half of the of the last question you asked. So, I just want to flag that really quickly: the question of whether some of the happiness effects we see could have been due to people feeling successful in these commitment devices. And just to be clear, those there were these two studies and the commitment devices were part of the second one on digital addiction. We see those happiness effects just in the Facebook study where all we ask people to do is quit Facebook. So I think there we have clean happiness effects that are not tangled up with the commitment. We also see you know, a little bit less significant, but positive happiness effects in the digital addiction study. So those second effects would be consistent with that. Um, but then, so coming to the COVID question, absolutely. I mean, the, you know, our experiment started running in like, whatever, February, March, 2020. So that that is like a really unusual time for the world and a really unusual time in particular for the way people are using and interacting with their phones. Um, and so we, we thought a lot about that. I think that really we have to think of that as just uh, a kind of caveat in a sense to this whole study that what we're measuring is the nature of digital addiction in that context. And there's really nothing we can do to say um, what it would look like in a different context. It would be great to have more follow-up work to kind of replicate these things. We did ask people a bunch of questions to, to try to at least get a sense about how they perceived their usage to be different um, as a result of the pandemic. So, so we asked people, you know, is your best guess that you're using your phone more or less now than you were on some of these addiction type questions, like asking, would you ideally reduce your usage? We asked people, you know, you just gave us the answer to that question now in 2020, would you guess that your answer would have been different a year ago? Um, as a way to get at that. And I think what we see is people are definitely using their phones more. 
So this is definitely a, a period of time where just usage is elevated. There's no really clear pattern either way in terms of the people seem to perceive themselves as more addicted or less addicted, you know, or are they happier with the way they're using their phones or less happy? Um, that, that doesn't have a clear direction. And you could really expect it to go either direction. You could expect like, I'm locked up. It's like if we, if we did something where we said, all right, now everybody's going to be locked up in their house, they can't leave their house, and they're just going to be there with their heroin, and they were heroin addicts, you might think that would like not be very good for the addiction problem and might make it worse. So you could have that kind of effect, like I'm locked up with my phone, and now I can't resist it. You could also imagine that it's making it better because the real value of having a device that lets you connect and communicate with other people goes way up if you're locked up in your house. So those things, those kinds of effects maybe balance out um, a little bit in that context. And, I, you know, similarly, I think, I think you could imagine awareness going up or going down. There doesn't seem to be a really clear pattern either way. By the way, Clemens and Katya, if you want to intervene, you should just go ahead. Um, so I have a question about, uh, which I found intriguing, about magnitude. So uh, Maxim Miner is asking, how does the reduction of other media like TV or other media affect personal well-being? And so how does the reduction of information in general affect personal well-being? Can we, can we gauge these effects against each other? Yeah. Um, I... I would love to know the answer to that question. I would say we still do not have analogous evidence for TV. So don't, we don't have randomized studies that looked at the effect of reducing TV on happiness. Um, I, I, you know, it would be interesting to think about. I think it's, it's not too late to do that. Like there's still a lot of people, particularly older cohorts, spending a lot of time watching television. So. I, I think it would be neat to do that so we could get that direct comparison, but I don't, I don't really know. I, th I think there, are, there's correlational evidence that shows just, if you look at people who spend seven, 10, 12 hours a day watching television, those tend not to be very happy people, but that's a little hard to interpret. I, I think if, if you took those effects at face value, they would be bigger, if anything, than, than what we see for social media. But I don't, I don't think those are very credible estimates of causal effects. So th there are a couple of, of big questions. I, I think these are questions that I, I, you know you could be probably talking about for half an hour. I'll keep them for the end. I have one small question from Carla Mirabella, and then I'll I'll go to the very uh, uh, you know wide range in questions. Um, Carla is asking: Could asking participants very direct questions, such as how happy they are, uh, could that induce experimenter demand effect? And how did you deal with this? Yeah, I, that's a great a great question. So. You know, for the rest of the audience, experimenter demand effect would refer to people maybe answer questions and behave differently in the experiment because they know that they're in an experiment and they have a sense of what is it we're trying to do or trying to get them to do. And, you know, that that is another big caveat um, that runs through all of this. It's very hard to do like a double blind Facebook quitting experiment where people quit Facebook, but they don't realize that they've quit Facebook or that they're part of an experiment. Um, you know, you can't really do that. So, so one way or another, people are going to be aware of um, being part of the experiment. I think you could you could imagine the impact of that going either way. Um, we tried to get at this by asking people at the end of the experiment, after everything was over, what they thought we as the experimenters were trying to do, or did 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 they perceive us to have had an agenda, and those answers did not suggest a clear tilt either way, meaning they didn't perceive either that we were particularly like on average, people did not say they perceived us to be anti Facebook or pro Facebook or, you know, trying to trying to show that social media is good or trying to show that social media is bad. I, I think that gave us some confidence and we, and we could do some some analysis to kind of break out, throw out people who did perceive big agendas on our part and show the results are the same without them. I, that that I, th I think makes me somewhat confident on experimenter demand effects per se, which is like they thought we had an agenda and they're trying to say what we want. But I think there's a broader issue of just awareness that you are part of an experiment can change your behavior. You know, that's, that's a, a broader concern. And I don't think we have anything 
we can do here other than just note that like, yeah, this is, it's a set of people who chose to be in this, this experiment. That's important. And it's a set of people who knew they were part of an experiment and that's important. And that means all of these effects could be different than if people really had no idea. It also, just on the happiness part, it is partly why we also had these text message questions just to provide a different kind of measure instead of just retrospective survey questions that might be particularly prone to this. We have these text message questions where we just ask people like, how happy do you feel right now? Um, thinking that that might improve the measurement a little bit, but it doesn't resolve the issue for sure. Can I maybe throw in one Can question? Maybe probably, throw in one. question. probably one, David, uh, David, you wanted to, uh, David, you wanted to David, have at the end of this talk, but uh, I'm just for, for being afraid of running out of time. It, it, I'd love to hear from both of you, actually, Matthew and Katerina, how you think about policy in this context. So in other areas, you know, soft drinks containing a lot of sugar or smoking and, and these things, uh, th there is a lot of research about policies, but we all know it's tricky to think about that uh, when, when addiction and these things come in. So I, I'd just be interested in uh, the way you think about policies or maybe an example where you'd say, okay, this would be a meaningful policy uh, in the case of social media. Yeah, let me... Katya, why don't you take that question? Uh, all right. Well, first of all, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, uh, Davide. And uh, indeed, that was the question which was on the back of my mind. And I wanted to, to ask that question uh, to Matt. Uh, but let me just first uh, give a couple of remarks about this. First of all, given that we're talking about an addictive good, there is no question but in my mind that there is a room for regulation. Uh, and, uh, you know, when we think about uh, uh, private companies which, which sell cigarettes or alcohol, we know that uh, there is room for the government to intervene. And with social media, there's uh, two parts of it. One, which uh, today's lecture was on, which is about how we spend our time. But the other part of this question is, what do people consume? And there's a lot of interesting work, including by Matt, about what actually people consume on social media. And here there is also possibly room for intervention. And the reason why I, I think that there is a room for intervention is because it, it, it is clear to me that the uh, incentives of the social media platforms are actually going exactly in the opposite direction to try to deal with the problems which Matt has talked about today. For example, uh, sort of, uh, first of all, what they are earning money on is on keeping attention of people. So the more addictive the stuff is, the better But uh, on the social media. But also it's important to note that that also means that this uh, content which is uh, which is promoted by the algorithms of social media may be more inflammatory, may be more um, emotional, which actually a lot of social psychologists suggest uh, make uh, the social media an outrage machine. Why is that the case? Well, because the emotional content is more engaging, and uh, that's that's how humans are hardwired. So, so then. You know, if we, uh, well, at least that's my opinion, I, I will be very interested in knowing what Matt thinks about the regulation. So if we agree that there needs to be room for regulation, it's much actually harder to tell than what exactly we should do. So as far as regulating content on social media, there's already quite a lot of um, understanding what we what we can do. We can, we can do a lot of sort of, uh, basically uh, screening of the content and uh, immediately blocking the content which may be you know calling for let's say hate speech or is particularly inflammatory and by the way sort of stepping back the reason why that kind of content is is uh, particularly harmful is because social media not only uh, may you know, uh, makes available all sorts of content out there but it also has a coordinating feature it is it can be act, it can act as a coordinating device so this means that hate speech for example could lead to real real hate crimes uh, or uh, you know there could be some calls for riots for example on social media 
and uh, therefore we uh, the governments could work with NGOs and uh, you know uh, organizations who could screen the the content on social media and work with the with the platforms on, on their algorithms to to be able to interview. At the same time, what I am much less sure about is how one could possibly intervene in limiting with policy devices, the limiting time people spend on social media, particularly when it comes to kids and teenagers. But overall, this is a very important question. Yeah, I... No. I agree. I think it's I think it's a super important question. I would I would say a couple things. So number one, I think there's absolutely scope for policy and regulation in this space. I think um, you know, broadly a couple of things. I think one the whole domain of privacy and data security, um, which is not the same thing as the well-being effects we're talking about here or addiction effects, but is is clearly related, I think is a great example of a place where there's a very clear economic case for essentially consumer protection type regulation. And, and I would be strongly in favor of that. I think on the well-being side, particularly when we're talking about children and teenagers here, you know, that there there's a very long tradition of regulating things differently for young people than what we allow for adults. And I think, you know, the case for things like um, minimum ages that are higher than the minimum ages today for access to things like social media, um, additional protections, limits on, on what kids are able to do, those things are hard to implement, hard to define. Um, but I, I, I think there's a lot of scope for improvement there. On the flip side, I think I'm, I'm skeptical of regulation as a broad solution to this problem for, for, you know, for, the, for the whole population, for the addiction issues here. I think um, a couple of things are different. If you, if you think about something like cigarettes or heroin, we have a very clear sense that the optimal use of those things is probably zero, that it would not be a bad thing for society if people just stop those using those things altogether. What makes this context challenging is, as we were talking about, these products are a bundle of uh, a, a lot of content and a lot of things that have huge positive value to people and to society and other things that have much less value and separating those is really hard. I, that, that example that we were talking about of like the passive versus active content and the way in which Facebook I think in a well-meaning way, tried to boost content that promoted meaningful social interactions and reduce passive, mindless kind of scrolling content. And that ended up having very perverse effects. That was something Facebook did privately, but that's pretty similar to the kind of thing you could imagine a well-meaning regulator doing. Um, and, and so I think that the potential for those kinds of, um, you know, unintended consequences is big, especially given how dynamic and rapidly changing this environment is. I think I think the truth is that the way in which social media is addictive and the social harms that causes in this kind of well-being happiness sense that we're talking about, my guess is to the question that was asked earlier, they're not fundamentally all that different from television. Um, and and you know the the idea that firms have a huge profit incentive, to drive engagement and attention is not new. That's what everybody producing television content for the last you know, 60, 70 years has been doing, is trying to find content that will hook people, that will keep them watching, that will get them through the commercial break to watch the next show, that will you know, make them pay attention to the ads and so on. None of that is really new. And I think, I think the same kind of challenges that we've wrestled with for half a century with the regulation of television are gonna apply here as well. So um, the questions keep coming, and unfortunately, our time is, is almost up. Um, I think it's great, Clemens, that you touched on one of the questions that was really high on the agenda here, and a lot of people are asking if I interpret the mood correctly, and I mean, you know, ultimately, this question about regulation. And the other question that always comes up here, if I you know, keep an eye on the mood on Slido, is, is the question about political polarization. And so, Katya, you've, you've referred 
um, to it in, in, in your answer. So I, I, you know, we don't have time anymore for big questions. So let me ask, you know, one question that I saw here on the tool that I thought provocative and is a good way to, to close, namely, how did your own research change your own usage and attitude towards social media? Please unmute yourself. Please unmute yourself. Whoa, sorry. Um, yeah, it's a good question. And I think my answer is going to be a little bit boring because the truth is I never have used myself social media very much. My such experiences I had with it did not seem uh, so positive, particularly things like Twitter that um, seem to to have a lot of downside if you say the wrong thing and that gets publicized widely. So I would say my research has solidified my sense that for my own personal life, having social media usage close to zero is um, pretty close to optimal without taking any stand on, on whether that is true for other people. I think that's turned out to be true for me uh, pretty clearly. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for the discussion. Thanks especially to all the people who have tuned in online and have asked questions and have made my life here as a moderator easy. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, yes, thank you very much. Oh, it's back back to me. Thank you so much for that fascinating uh, Q&A. So, um, Clemens, any final thoughts uh, on the themes we touched on this evening? Uh, thank you to all of all of you uh, and to you, of course, Marcus. Uh, in terms of final thoughts, you know, I think this was just a brilliant example of how uh, economic research and and social sciences uh, can. Uh, provide a solid basis for discussing questions that are vital to all of us. Uh, I think the first step, this is some, you know, something um, I learned today. The first step is really working hard to understand what's going on, uh, understand the facts or the evidence. And, and then we have a totally different basis for discussing very important social questions and e economic policy questions. And, uh, I, you know, I, I think this is really an example of outstanding research. So I enjoyed this very much um, uh, uh, and, and uh, hope to see, see more of it. Thank you. Over to you, Marcus. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, it just leaves me now to um, thank you all for watching. Many thanks to Matthew, uh, to Davida, of course, to Clemens and um, Ekaterina. And um, on behalf of everybody at the CES, it's a very, very special word of thanks for the Munich Re for their continued support. Thank you so much for watching. And wherever you are in the world, please stay safe and stay healthy. Goodbye.